now I'm just going to bring us into our opening song. At the beginning of a Westwood service, whether in person or online, we pause to affirm that the land where our building and many of us gathered here this morning resides has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality, and continues to do so. A Mistichewaskigan, the Cree name for Edmonton, meaning Beaver Hills House, is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional gathering place and home to diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Matisse, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. I acknowledge my role as a treaty person and feel continuously called to explore what that means and how to be a responsible and respectful ally. I encourage each of you to seek understanding on how to be curious and respectful treaty people. Welcome to this morning, this day, and this opportunity to be together in community. My name is Alara Stephanie Cadet. My pronouns are they and them, and I'm your service leader this morning. I also have the great privilege and joy of being Westwood's Director of Religious Education. Our Speakers this morning are a little bit of me, but mostly our wise puppet friends, Spruce and Goldie. I'd also like to lift up our children's and youth committee folks, Laura Beard and Brenda Niscaero, and our wonderful board liaison, Lorian Kennedy, for helping bring forward ideas and fleshing out those ideas to shape today's service. Bill Lee and I are your tech wizards and our musician, helping hold all the tenderness this morning is Sheila Kawan. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we come together each week to learn more about what it means to be human. We're not here because we've figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another and how to celebrate our differences together. And on a few extra magical Sundays throughout the year, we also come to play together in our treasured all ages services. Thank you for showing up from wherever you may be this morning. You are welcome here. Our shared Chalice lighting words for this morning are by David Breeden and are entitled Justice, Meaning, and Purpose. We light this chalice, remembering and honoring our own tradition and celebrating the rich diversity of traditions among us. 
as we search for justice, meaning, and purpose, may we remember that justice, meaning, and purpose live first in deeply listening to one another. Goldie, 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 guess what, guess what, guess what? What? Spruce? I can finally show you the thoughtful place, and I'm so excited to share it. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, and it's your first time here, and come on, I really want to share it with you. Come on, come on. Ooh, who's not listening in the thoughtful place? Spruce, is it you? I didn't hear what Goldie had to say, did you? You still have to listen, Spruce. The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition in many Unitarian Universalist congregations. And seeing or listening to what is happening in each other's lives, it allows us to understand each other's worlds a little better, enabling us to share the joys and offer comfort to those with concerns or sorrows. It helps us to be a true community. You may now type your candles into the chat as Sheila plays us a beautiful piece by Johann Sebastian Bach. I light a final candle, real and virtual, for all of the joys and concerns which remain held tenderly in our hearts. Now please join me with your mics muted and repeating our affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. One definition of giving is to freely set aside for a purpose. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we are privileged to pay our own way. Our members and friends freely set aside money for Westwood so we may accomplish the things we dream of and do to live out our shared values. In these difficult times, our work of connecting and creating compassionate community is more important than ever. Ways to donate are on your screen. If you are able and consider the work we do together valuable, please donate generously or consider donating on a monthly basis. If this is your first time with us or you consider yourself a newcomer or you are simply unable, please consider your presence in our community the gift you give 
and feel free to attend any of our events or programming without financial obligation. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Hey Goldie, I felt like I wanted to check in with you after what I saw happened in the thoughtful place. You look like you might be upset. Are you okay? Well, not really. It's really hard being friends with Spruce sometimes. Yeah, Spruce gets pretty excited pretty easily. I can understand that. But I feel like it's more than that, isn't it? Yes, it is, Alara. Sometimes I feel like I can't say anything at all. Because Spruce doesn't let me finish speaking. So it's really hard to say what I want. Yeah, I can understand that. I've definitely had times where I've had people talk over me, and it can really hurt my feelings because it makes me feel like I'm not being heard. Is that how you're feeling right now? Yes, very much so. And also just sad. Because I wanted to say that I had already been in the thoughtful place once before and felt like it was really special. Yeah, I understand. Spruce was cutting you off because Erm was so excited, wasn't Spruce? Yes, it was very, very hard to say what I wanted to. And I should be able to speak slowly and still be heard. Yeah, you absolutely should be able to. It's really important for us to be quiet enough and listen carefully enough to hear what the people in our lives who we care about are saying. How would you like it if I talked to Spruce? I really want you guys to hug and make up, because I know you're really good friends. Yes, I would like that a lot, because I care about Spruce quite a bit. But I have to be able to feel like Erm is listening to me. I totally understand. We're going to talk about it a little bit more with the rest of our friends, and then we'll come back and I'll talk to Spruce, and I really hope that we can sort this all out together.
Has there ever been a time when you felt you could not speak up? Why did you feel unable to voice your thoughts or feelings? Or has there ever been a time when you have spoken over others or interrupted them? How did you feel when this happened? One of the organizations that I've been listening deeply to recently is Pyros, the Prairie Youth Radical Organizing School. Pyros has a lot to offer, and I recently attended a few of their worship workshops, and I've learned this next activity from them. The main intention of this activity is listening. The listening partner may not respond verbally to their partner or to the questions until it is their time to turn to speak. There might be silence between partners, and that's okay. The listening partner's job is to hold the space for their speaking partner until it's their turn to talk. I know for one, this is a challenge for me, so I'm sure that it'll also be a challenge for some of you, but I think we're all up for it. I'm going to give about 15 seconds at the beginning to decide who goes first, but this isn't a conversation, it's a listening activity. If this feels too vulnerable, you have the option of staying in the center and contemplating the questions. We're all going to stay muted in the center space, and I'll be holding the space in silence for that contemplation time. Has there ever been a time when you felt you could not speak up? Why did you feel unable to voice your thoughts or feelings? Has there ever been a time where you have spoken over others or interrupted them? How did you feel when this happened? Hey, Spruce. I think we need to have a little bit of a hard conversation. Are you down for that right now? Yes, yes, I think I am, because I think Goldie is upset with me, and I'm not really sure why, and I don't want to hurt her feelings. She's my friend, and I care about her a lot. What did I do? That's a really kind response, really, Spruce. I'm glad that you're so receptive to this conversation. I think what you did was you talked over her quite a bit, and you didn't listen to what she was saying, and that really hurt her feelings. Well, well, it's just, it's so hard, because my brain is so squirrely, and I'm going really, really fast, and, and, oh, it's so hard to slow down, and I know that her and I have had these conversations before, where... I thought that what she was doing with her time and her stories were boring, and then I realized that that was really mean because I care about her, so I should want to listen to her stories, but it's still hard sometimes because my mind is in so many places, Alara, and I was just really excited to share the thoughtful place with her, and I feel really bad. I'm sure you do, but you know what would help? Maybe. A few things, actually. So, first of all, you really do need to apologize. Yeah, I realize that, but, but I need to know what I can do differently if I'm going to apologize. That's exactly what the next thing I was going to say would, was. After you apologize, you've really got to focus a little bit on listening to your friend when she's talking. I know that can be hard if you are excited to say something, but... You have to think about how you're making her feel when she's not able to speak all of the words that she wants to say. Yeah, you're right. So, I guess I just really have to work on slowing down enough and, and making space for Goldie to speak everything she wants to say. That's exactly it, Bruce. You just gotta make that space. That's... Very, very kind of you and wise of you to see that that is a thing that you can do. Yes, I'm going to work on it really, really hard, and I think I better apologize. Yep.
Yeah, I think you better apologize, too. That's a very good start. I want to start by again acknowledging that the activity was a stretch and a challenge for some of us. Spruce knows it. Erm's mind is always working so fast that it's not unusual for Erm to interrupt someone when they're speaking. As an enthusiastic, often on the extroverted side of the spectrum person who is also often in leadership positions, I can honestly understand this challenge of Spruce's, and I'm sure many of you can as well. Holding space and silence for others is a skill that's extra difficult to practice in our fast-paced, entertainment-based society. And today, I want to lift up why it's important to practice this skill and be aware of intentionally and be aware of intentionally stretching ourselves to slow down enough within our own minds to really deeply listen to each other. Simple answer is because it can very quickly become a social justice issue. Knowing an answer and understanding why are two very different things. So I'm going to do what I do best and tell you a story. Before I do though, I want to acknowledge that this is a story of my own experience because that's the only story that I really have the right to share. That being said, I also want to acknowledge that disability justice is by far not the only place that this story applies. The questions we need to be asking ourselves when it comes to listening are, whose voices do we hear the least? Why? And perhaps most importantly, how can I as an individual and we as a community hold space for those voices to be heard? I'd like you to hold these questions in your hearts and minds as I share my story. When I was about 15 years old, I became a counselor in training at Camp Easter Seal in Saskatchewan. Camp Easter Seal is a camp for people with disabilities of all kinds, from folks like me who have mobility challenges and ongoing physical health issues to the highest degree of physical or intellectual disability or so we've been classified as folks with disabilities. At camp, we were all people. And as counselors, that is how we were trained to behave in our interactions with campers. Having been a camper for six years before becoming staff, I had no difficulty understanding that we were all people before we were our disabilities. I'd been friends with folks with every degree of disability since I was a very young child. In fact, the whole reason that I wanted to become a counselor in the first place was to give back to a community that I had felt deeply, deeply nourished by for so many years. Plus, kids can be cruel. I understood far too well what it felt like to be othered or made fun of for being different. I still remember a joke that one of the cool kids in my grade one class asked me, do you like ripple chips? said yes, excited to be engaged with by a peer, and he replied, that's because you're a cripple. Being the punchline often enough, and then being in a camp community where we all just cared about each other, made respect and dignity very self-evident. But being staff was challenging in a brand new way. The motto at Camp Easter Seal is, campers come first. This is a very well-intended motto, I'm sure. But good luck being a staff with a disability. Without going into too many details, I'll say that every year I was shuffled roll to roll to find one that I fit into and constantly told I wasn't adapting well enough and told that I was acting too much like people's friends rather than as a staff person when we'd already been friends for six years. Being 15, I'm sure that there were things about the transition from a camper to a staff member that I didn't understand, but I wasn't taught those things at the time. I was trained like every other staff member, and the existing relationships I had developed were neither acknowledged nor respected. What became abundantly clear to me then, and is still abundantly clear to me now, is that the roles we played there were seen before the people in them. As staff, I learned how performative so much of the respect of our campers were. We were taught to act friendly, but to always be in control of things. 
Even when our campers were seniors who had known each other for 40 years or more. I worked at camp for four years. And the last year I was put into the role of kitchen staff where I rarely got to see the people I'd been friends with for most of my life. After that year, I decided not to work there again. Unlo unlike most campers who can attend without age limit, I could never return as a camper because I'd been a staff person. But I still very much wanted to work with folks with disabilities. These are my people in a way no one else can be because we don't size each other up based on what we are able to do. So it became my dream to work as an assistant at Lush. There, I was living in community with folks with and without disabilities, providing assistance where needed, but with the central goals of creating community and helping people with disabilities be visible and beloved members of society. The first couple of years I was in a community in Nova Scotia. It was strong advocacy work. And there were times when, there, when that took the form of legal advocacy, but 99% of the time our advocacy was about telling able-bodied people to listen to our friends with disabilities. And I don't mean in big ways either. It took months, months of asking staff at Tim Hortons to speak directly to our friends rather than to us staff to see results. And even longer to get them to hand them their own change for a donut when it had been clearly them that had paid and not us as staff members. It's amazing how difficult it can be for people to listen carefully enough to understand someone with a speech impediment or to be patient enough to let somebody who can't speak point to the donut that they want. It made me very, very angry that my friends were treated like they were invisible in their own hometown. But of course, to make any different, the only response to a staff is a kind, polite, oh, I'm not ordering today, my friend is. Could you please ask them what they'd like? And of course, as I've aged, I've learned that it's not that one person's fault in the Tim Hortons, it's a systemic issue. And these small interactions do actually help shift things over time. But I was 18 at that time, and I hated how artificial my kindness felt in those situations. I worked with and was in community with Larsh for a total of four years. I loved working with Larsh. Obviously there were challenges of plenty, but I loved it. It was meaningful work and I knew I was helping create change in the world. Okay, so it being a Catholic organization, I was selective with who I trusted my queerness with, but overall, it was an incredible experience. But then my transplanted kidney rejected. The first year after that happened, I did some casual work at the Larsh in Saskatoon, and I was really grateful to be in a part of that community in such a hard year. And then I moved back to Edmonton. I was so excited to be with Larsh Edmonton. I had grown up here and I was excited to connect with old friends and thrilled that I was well enough to go back to live in assistant work after my year of being too sick to do anything full time. I wasn't nearly as stable and healthy as I generally am now. Some of you likely remember that time. It's when I first reconnected with Westwood as well. But I was well enough to do meaningful work and I was excited to be able to. I was one of the most experienced assistants living in that house and had intended to be there for many years to come. But after one year, I quit working for Lush Edmonton. The reason? Because I wasn't allowed to take a day off that wasn't a day with dialysis treatment because to quote them, I was taking time away from community. The Lush policy was that we had one day off per week and one weekend off per month. You heard that correctly. For survival, I need four hours of dialysis treatment three times a week. In those days before I did dialysis at home, I also needed travel time to get to and from the hospital, plus whatever time was needed for medical things going wrong, which they did quite a bit more in those couple years right after my kidney rejected. None of the time time needed for dialysis is a choice, obviously, and it's certainly not time off. So I was put into a position where my days off all included five hours of medical regime. As assistants, we were allowed to swap our days off in the week, but even if it was okay with the rest of my house, 
all of the staff in my house, I wasn't allowed to swap to a day that I didn't have dialysis. Now, I have no difficulty speaking up for myself, but I couldn't win that battle. It was a decision that was made entirely without consulting me, and I tried to fight it, but it wasn't going to change. So I left, because I had to for my health. In a community intended to help integrate folks with disabilities into society, nobody was listening to my needs in any way. Developing the skills to listen and hold space for each other and for marginalized voices is a justice issue. In Emergent Strategy, Adrian Marie Brown talks about working to balance taking space and making space in our organizations and communities. I love our community so, so deeply. And I'm a person who has always spoken up for justice when I'm in the position to do so. And I haven't discussed disability in the sermon for the decade that I've been a part of this community until today. I didn't wanna be seen as our disabled staff member or for anyone to ever think that the only justice issue I care about is disability because I'm too close to it. But this is where my desire to create a just world began. And I trust that none of you will think that now because you know me. And yet the hardest and most vulnerable and courageous thing that I can end by saying is that there are still things I've left unspoken this morning that I hold tenderly in my heart. Thank you all for the time you've spent this morning listening softly. Goldie, 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 will you come? I really, really, really have something I need to say. And, and, and I also really want to hear what you have to say. I really, really, really do. Hi, Spruce. What did you want to say to me? I just wanted to say I'm sorry, and, and I want to learn how to make space to listen to you better, that's all. I feel really bad. Thanks, Bruce. You really hurt my feelings, you know, but I will definitely forgive you because... I care about you, and maybe now that you're listening and showing me how much you care, I'll feel much better. I really hope so. I'm going to try really, really hard not to talk over you and to slow down a little bit. I mean... Not all the time because I'm still a squirrel and I still talk fast, but I won't talk when you're talking. That's very kind, Spruce. Then I'll feel brave enough to say everything that I want to say. Yeah, and I want to hear what you have to say. I just have to work on keeping my own mind still enough and slowing down enough to really hear you. But that's what friends are for, right, Goldie? Yes, Bruce. Friends are for listening. Thank you so much for hearing me. You're welcome, Goldie. I'm glad we're friends. Me too, Bruce. Our closing words this morning are used with the permission of poet Emily Kadar. The piece is entitled Earthside. We are asked to arrive here, Earthside, to occupy every inch of the body we're given to learn its languages, its needs, and gifts. We are asked to use it as a compass, to harbor us in safely and lead us through the wild. We are asked to care for this place, 
with the grit and grace of dirt on our hands. We are asked to speak, to give voice to the voiceless, and translate light to language to cast the widest net. To include everything inside of it, to crack the heart wide open and never close it again. When we are pulled apart by longing, we are asked to keep showing up, to follow this soft, insistent tether. To become what we love, to pour ourselves into the hands of the ancestors, to be held by them like water, to quench the mouths of our children, to nourish them with who we become. We are asked to belong, finally, to ourselves, to each other, to the land, to our own shape-shifting shadows, to our own threadbare, indelible light. We are asked to belong to the old tales that brought us here and the new ones that will keep us alive. We are asked to belong to the great turning wave of this time and this place. We are asked to puncture our breath with both sorrow and praise. We are asked to answer by becoming again and again the way. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. I'm going to lift up that next weekend, next Sunday, is our service with Anne, with Reverend Anne, a willing spirit.